This exhibition from our superior is part of what we call a collection focus, an artist in the museum's permanent collection whose work we collect in depth. The idea behind collecting like this is to show how artists' ideas germinate, grow, flourish, and change over a period of time. Not only does this document their careers accurately, but it also is a great teaching tool for the public to understand how artists' minds work and how serious they are about developing their ideas and concepts. And I'm here with our curator of exhibitions, Lena Vigna, to talk to you about the work of Mara Superior. One of the nice things with Mara Superior is that her work is so autobiographical. So we could start talking about her life as we start talking about the work. And this is no better place to start, is we have three large scale pieces, two in the form of teapots, and each one of these pieces also documents her background in painting and drawing. It's mainly about content and narrative and a little less about function, although because she's so interested in the history of ceramics, that also comes into play. She was born and raised in New York City, and if a young person who goes to the gym a lot is called a gym rat, Mara is probably a could be called a museum rat in the sense that she spent her childhood at the Metropolitan Museum of Art every Saturday going wherever she was interested in throughout the museum and its collections and was a self-educator in all ways. And many of these pieces reference not just the history of ceramics, but the history of art, her travels, um, her experiences, her personal life. She calls it a collection. It's very obvious where she's going with it. And I think that sort of early thinking about sort of documenting a life or a history or a story through objects, through this concept of collecting and categorizing and, and looking at the world that way, like you can start to see it like really early on. You have the piece in and of itself, you have a representation of a ceramic piece on it, you have like miniature representations of ceramic pieces on the top of it, so there's this constant sort of layering. Down below, the decoration on the large pot itself or this plinth, this pot-shaped plinth that she's created out of course, and is decorated with little um, Mara drawings of kind of classic Greek uh, pottery, and there are little sort of almost like composition book images with text on that say, you know, Greek vases with the dates, and there's an image that says a temple with three individual vessels on pedestals. Now on one hand, this relates to the temple in Greek culture and Greek architecture, and at the same time, it's referencing, I think, the, the art museum as, the, you know, we often refer to it as the temple of culture. So she's kind of saluting the history of this portion of art history and at the same time she's saluting the museums for presenting that material to the public. This is one of my favorite teapots if we're talking favorites in the in the show. Do you want to talk about your take on this a little bit? Sure I think it's a really good example too of how size um, is such a big part of it, like literally a big part if of I it. If I stand next to it, you can yeah. get a really good idea. It's like your torso, right? One of the great things here is that you see some of the motifs that repeat, some of the iconography that picks up a lot with her. Animals, um, nature, the home. This is in the case of this piece, there's a teapot that sits on top of a ceramic plinth, and then the ceramic teapot atop the ceramic plinth then sits atop a gold-leafed um, wooden base with a ceramic label that says house on it that's tacked on with brass screws. We're seeing her elevate the domestic subject matter and the domesticity of the object that she's using as her basic form here. She's elevating that to the level of something that should be noticed, paid attention to, exhibited. In my essay I talk about her connection to the idea of love and intimacy and home life and how she just embraces it. Everything about her is very, it seems genuine and sincere. And she talks about that too, that she's just a positive person. And so she makes work that's positive. The work is very life affirming, I think you would say. Mm -hmm. it, it has a, a domestic quality to it that is in, that I find in no way to be cloying. There's right. a There's purity. not sentimental in a way that's bad. It's kind of like a purity and it's kind of an acknowledgement that this is one of the joys of life, is having a family, being in love. Um, being connected to each other. And yes. these are very positive, I think, um, messages that we need to be, be reminding and sharing with each other. Her imagery frequently reminds me of historic American samplers. 
pictorial images and text and numbers combined together. And there are content connections as well, like samplers would talk about a personal life or you know contemporary life or someone's ideas or thoughts about something, and that is what we have with Mara. While we keep talking about the work not being functional, Mara actually talks about how she would use some of the work. And we, we know of a few other people that would as well. That are very, um, we're, we're very gutsy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and not, di not dishwasher it. But it's, yeah. it's nice too, because if, you, if you, something's presented on a platter, it's a series of unfolding. It's like a layering as food's removed from the platter, you get to unfold the story. Every family has somewhere it's, you know, there's an aunt, there's a grandmother, there's a, there's a mother who when the platter came out, it was a holiday, it, you know, pasta went on it, or a turkey went on it. The associations of these objects do mean things to, to people that we all bring to these shapes. And then she's bringing in um, images that even further pushes that, that response in, in the viewer's mind when he or she looks at the, at the pieces. So now we've been spending a lot of time talking about Mara's interest in house and home, but she didn't stay at home. We have, we have work that reflects one of her other great loves, which is travel. So here we have the monumental Bella Italia teapot. There's a, a crest or a shield. There's a path back into what's described as Toscana or Tuscany. There's a Venetian gondolas. There's the Colosseum. Crowning the teapot at the very top is the Mona Lisa, which she actually adorns with a crown. What's on your side? Is there food? Well, I still have Mona at the top. There's a, a bowl of pasta. I also have the Leaning Tower of Pisa, leaning in, the, in, in, the, in its environment with stupendo written next to it as, as a bubble coming out of the, sort of its mouth. I, I think what you have to remember is she's dealing with slabs of wet clay and that's not that easy to wrangle and to shape and to hold together. And she talks as well in her interview with me about loss and things that didn't, don't work sometimes. And um, I think when you're looking at her work, you have to think about taking a sheet and forming it into these shapes. Well, these are interesting. First, I wanna comment on the shape. Uh, they're this sort of midway point between a platter and a bowl. I'd say someone who spent a lot of time in Italy would certainly want a lip that would catch all the sauce of what's yeah, ever been served. That's a very good point, you know? right, for a very hearty appetite with this sort of oversized bowl slash platter. She's used the animal in a, in a different way in each of these three platters that I find kind of fascinating. So on one hand, uh, we have you know the, the piece here that says the you know wildlife on it. It has, as we would think of them when we're watching a National Geographic special on television and thinking about saving large herds of animals and preventing extinction and the ecological issues that are connected with wanting to take care of the planet. That's one route. Then here we have, uh, this one is called Jumbo the Elephant. All right, now to me right away, because the elephant is wearing a, you know, a hat and, you know, and, a, and a drape, um, and it is named specifically, we're talking about a circus animal or the way we kind of treat animals for entertainment. And so she's talking about that kind of animal. Now the black swan platter is a little bit different in that it's a, a political statement about the 2008 economic downfall that happened to the global economy. It's a, it was a big bump and it definitely impacted a lot of people, but it will happen again. So how do we recover? So to that point of her trying to see a way to move forward. We have another um, piece devoted to the zebra. It's a, a slightly different shape than we've looked at up until now. This is a, more of a, a flat, low vase. And there's a little bit of a, a, a waviness to the, to, the, to the piece that I think speaks to how difficult the porcelain is to control when it's wet and it wants to go somewhere and you want it to go in the other direction. That waviness is actually picked up in this piece as well. It's the idea that you have these heavy slabs of porcelain that at some point might flex um, in the firing, which I think she talks about both as something that she really respects and responds to in the media. We associate perfection, in our culture at least, with machining and things that are that things that are machine produced and produced in a, in a factory setting where there's very little room for variation from one object to the next. The thing about having a studio and making everything uh, by, by hand, there's always a little bit of, of, of chance that when you open the 
the kiln door, it's not turning out quite the way you thought it was going to. And in the case of the shape alterations, I think she's saying that the clay has as much of a hand in creating her works as she does, and it has a little bit of a mind of its own, and she's giving it the space to do that. We have a piece that reflects a collaboration um, because Mara and Roy would sometimes work together. And her husband was an avowed fisherman, so the fact that fish appear in these pieces, I think, are, are not only her interest in the environment, but I think they're part of her domestic life as well. She thinks Roy was sometimes reluctant. He didn't need to work with her the way she liked to work with him. But if she put the focus on water, he would generally come around because again, to the point of him being a, a fisherman. A lot of work being about love and the layers of relationship. And this piece has the back and forth between the two of them as an actual object. He was interesting in that he was a painter, a sculptor, and a furniture maker. And, and worked in all of those vernaculars back and forth. The cabinet is, is, is really interesting from many perspectives, including the fact that it really is a presentation cabinet um, you know, for this bigger piece. There is a space below where you could put something, but um, your sort of the, the painted motif on the cabinet in and of itself suggests waves and water. It's this lovely sort of turquoisey blue, like deep ocean. The worm on the hook to get him to do this was the, the trout is the central part of the, the main teapot here. And there are our mermaids presented much more pleasantly, I think, as opposed to the sirens that would lure men to their death on the rocks. Um, they're almost more like purveyors of fine jewels. From this part down, it's wood um, plinth, presentation plinths again that Roy has made. I'm a bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a theater nut at times, and I keep looking at this and thinking of a musical number in a Broadway show or a Follies presentation mm -hmm. with, you know, the, the, the like feature. A water ballet. A water yeah. ballet, you know, <laughs> Esther Williams in a movie with the water mm -hmm. ballet. There is this sense of it being a, almost like a stage set as much as it is a teapot inside a China cabinet. It's a great combination of both of their works, and I'm glad she talked them into it. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that's really significant to uh, recognize with Mara is that she really is a contemporary artist in a very self-reflexive way, and it connects her to other contemporary artists working in clay. Um, Roberto Lugo, Ann A.G., Chris Anseman, they're all very, very familiar with the history and the lineage that they're a part of. They respect it and they respond to it. They also add in things that very much make the work contemporary. You've heard Lena and I talking about her essay and my interview with Mara Superior, and this is where you will find that information. We've published a collection study guide. It includes an essay by Lena Vigna, and it includes a multi-page interview uh, that I conducted with Mara, where she's very, very sharing with information and detail. I want to thank you for spending time with us for this tour. We hope you've enjoyed it, and we hope we can see you again sometime in the not-too-distant future for another tour. Thanks.